Carmen get it, definitely. And, uh, well, there's a Carmen in the studio here tonight. It's uh, Carmen Capobianco, who's joining us on the second episode of the online movie show. I'm Phil Hall, and uh, at the bottom of the hour, we're going to be joined by Debbie Rochon. She's, yes, sir. She's going to be phoning in from Canada to uh, talk about Model Hunger, which is a movie that you two uh, worked on. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was behind the camera in this one, and you were in front of the, uh, the camera. I was. I was. What's it like have, being directed by Debbie Rochon? Uh, what's it like being directed by Debbie Rashan? All right, you want the real answer, I'm sure. Oh yes. Okay, um, because there's a lot of there were a lot of fantasies going through my head as you probably. Debbie is, uh, as you know, and and we've talked about this, probably one of the absolute most wonderful, sweetest people that ever walked the face of the earth, and 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 I. I met her for the first time in the early 90s when she was a kid just starting out. And little did I know that she, she was a fan of Galactic Gigolo uh, a long time ago through the uh, uh, which a movie I was in, in in the 80s. So I met her in 93 when she had just released um, Santa Claus, John, John Rousseau's movie, Santa Claus, and uh, C-L-A-W-S. And uh, then I met her again, I met her, and, and, and I kept meeting her, and we kept, you know, taking pictures. So I have all these pictures of us aging <laughs> gracefully together, she more than I. Um, and then uh, I had said to her at, at one point, because um, Tommy Seymour, hey. is, you, you probably know, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Uh, we were in, I don't know how many movies together, you and I. We had never had a scene together. We've done five movies together, and we this we never actually met. The first time we met was when you came here to PPRN a few weeks ago to do a show, uh, Peter Pino's talk show on Tuesday nights. Yes, yes. And it was a pleasure meeting you after after all these years. And the same thing was going on with Debbie. I had uh, We had done a few movies together, and I never had a scene with her. A bikini bloodbath and... Um, VHS Massacre was another one, and we we did a couple of James Balsamo films that you know we had done together. And I keep telling James, I want to see with Debbie, and he keeps saying, Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Um, so anyway, I was at uh, a convention, Monster Mania in New Jersey, and and she was there, and and uh, there were a couple of people. Do you know Mike? You must know Mike Watt and Amy Lynn Best. Oh, Mike Watt very well. Yes, yeah. Mike is uh, wonderful. I've known Mike for years. In fact, he coerced Tommy into getting an interview with me because Tommy uh, sent him a copy of one of his movies. It might have been Everything Moves Alone or it might have been Profits or whatever. And, no, I think it was one of his early ones. And uh, Mike read the credits. And he said, oh, my God, Carmen Cavallian was in this movie. And, he's, he was a huge, and I'm very flattered to say that he was a huge fan of mine. So he said to, he said to Tommy, if you, if you uh, uh, give me a contact number for Carmen so I can interview him, I will review your movie. So way back then, I interviewed with Mike. It was a really great time. And over the years, we ran in contact with each other. We became, we became friends who never met, just like my thousands of friends on Facebook who I've never met. But um, I respect it, just like I respect your work. I mean, you're a great writer. Uh, Mike's a great writer. And uh, so when I heard that he was going to be in New Jersey, because uh, he lives in Pittsburgh, I said, I'm going to drive down there because Mike is there and Amy is there and Debbie's there and all these people are there. So I drove down and... Um, after the whole thing was over, Debbie came outside. Uh, we were waiting after the convention, and she was there. Mike was there, and Amy was there. And I turned to Debbie, and I, don't, I still don't think she knew who I was. And I said, you know, Debbie, we've been in X amount of films together. We never had a scene. Would you do a scene with me now? And she looked at me, and she most graciously said, yeah, yeah, okay. So I gave Mike my camera. He directed it. We just goofed around. And you can see that scene on my Facebook page of Debbie and I just totally, totally goofing around. But I originally thought she knew me when Tommy was making, uh, when he was making, what was the f first movie he did with Debbie? Was it Bikini Bloodbath? Uh, the first one he did with Debbie was Bikini Bloodbath, yes. Okay. So he says to me, hey, Carmen, you'll never guess who I got to be in this movie. And I said, who? He said, Debbie Rashan. I said, oh, man, I would love to meet her again. Because, you know, when you first meet Debbie, you instantly fall in love with her. Oh, definitely. And... Um, so then he told me later on, he said, Debbie's not doing the movie. I said, why? He goes, I don't know. She didn't contact me. So I ran into her at a convention, and I said, you know, Debbie, what's going on? Are you okay? You know, Tommy's waiting for you to do the movie. And she, and she said, I got into this. I was doing this movie. I know. This actually, it was supposed to be Land of College Profit. She was supposed to be in the film. I know where the story's going, but you, you can tell us. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I said to Debbie, you know, what happened? She said, I was doing this movie, and um, a guy was supposed to come after me with a machete, and they held up my hand to catch the machete, and he never changed it for the prop machete, and it was a real machete, and she showed me the scars in her hand, and then she had a, 
a magazine cover of her hand all stitched up and everything. So she said, that's why I didn't, I didn't want to call Tommy. I said, you know what? Let's you know do the movie. Take a picture with me. Hold up the magazine, and I sent it to Tommy, and everything got ironed over, and and she ended up doing it. And then I also didn't get to do a scene with her. So, but years have passed, and and we've kind you know been in, and and I I, I said I don't think she remembers me from anybody. You know, I say hi, and she goes oh, hi because she's like that with everybody. You know, she's so sweet to everybody, and then all of a sudden, um, uh, and I have to thank Richard Griffin. You know Richard Griffin. Right? Yes, he does. Very talented filmmaker out of Rhode Island. Yes, and uh, I'm on the I'm on Facebook with Richard. I'm talking to somebody, and my name pops up, and Richard sees me, and he says, "Are, are you the Carmen Capobianco that was in Cycles of Love and Galactic Gigolo?" And I said, "Yes," and then Debbie pops on, and she goes, "You're you were in Galactic Gigolo?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. She goes, "That was like my favorite movie from the '80s." I'm like, "Oh my god!" I just lost all respect for Debbie for just for a second. <laughs> And then uh, two weeks later, she offered me Model Hunger. And I'm just wondering, I said, you know, we've known each other since 93, and she never, I mean, in 93, I kind of looked like I looked in the movie, but in, you know, 2013, I look like an old guy now. So, you know, It's funny, too, because you, uh, you obviously have a very good reputation in the industry, because as I mentioned prior to starting the show last week, we had Michael Mangelo on Love our program. Michael. Yeah, Michael's great. And I mentioned your name, and he just burst into a big smile. And we've had conversations here in the studio about uh, when people get a bad reputation uh, and uh, problems follow them, and it doesn't go away very easily. And it certainly happens in the movie world. I know many uh, people, very prominent people too, who haven't been able to uh, get decent work even though they're extremely talented because of their reputation. That's very true. That's very true. Um, I, I've met a lot of actors and directors over the years, and believe it or not, the nicest people are in the horror business. Yes. And, uh, and I find that weird, you know, that you would think that you know, these are horrible people, but they're not. They're very sweet people. But as long as you go in, you do your job, and you um, uh, are nice to people, you keep a good re- reputation. I mean, I, my thing is, is I'm not an actor. Um, I can't memorize lines. Uh, but I do, and people say, "Hey, that was your," and that's totally false. I, I'm I'm not an actor. I do comedy, and there's a difference. You're still acting, but you know my kind of comedy is is, is the great kind of comedy where where it's um, you're not there to to uh, be funny. You're there to make people laugh, and you don't need to be funny to make people or think you're being funny or try to be funny. You make people laugh by. Have you seen Psychos in Love? We did that seriously, you know what I mean, and it, it was the situations and everything that that made it a, a a funny movie. And then you get people who overact and and do these dumb things, and you're like, ah, he's really pushing it, he's overdoing it, and that's not what you want to do. So when I was going to do Model Hunger, I said, well, she saw Galactic Gigolo, Debbie, and uh, so she probably wants me to be the comedy relief because that's my rep, you know. Carmen, yeah, he's a funny guy, he does these funny movies. So I, I go up there, and I'm all set. I'm reading these lines. She goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm reading the line. She says, no. <laughs> Let me tell you about Sal. Sal was the guy I played in the movie. And she gives me this backstory on Sal, and it's depressing, and it's horrible, and it's dark. And I'm like, what? And she said, yes. This is a serious role here. And she had to keep telling me, stop being funny. <laughs> that was her thing. I'm like, okay. So she worked with me. And uh, being that most of my lines were with Tiffany, who in and of herself is a wonderful actress. I've seen her do so many different things. Tiffany's last name is? Oh, yeah, oh sorry. T- T- Tiffany Shepes. Okay. Uh, uh, which, <laughs> you know, she's in her early 30s, and I'm in my late 50s, and there was somebody else cast to play my wife, and I was all excited because she's a wonderful, beautiful actress. And then... Uh, I guess she didn't do it anymore. And then Debbie sent me an email. She said, Tiffany Shepes is going to play your wife. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh my God. And I was scared shitless of Tiffany Shepes because she had a rep of being this this tough woman. And I've seen her at conventions and she's all tough and, and sarcastic and stuff like that. So I'm like, oh my God, Tiffany Shepes. And she said, can I ask you if you would you know, dye your hair? And I'm like, sure, I'll dye my hair. And I, I, I picked the worst color. If you see the movie, you're like, what were you thinking? 
And so I, I uh, 7 o'clock in the morning of the day we were going to shoot, I got to meet Tiffany Shepis. She brought her daughter. And Tiffany is so freaking sweet and wonderful. She's a great mom and totally off. I guess her chiller theater persona is totally different from her real personality. She is just a wonderful human being. And she let me borrow her, her daughter to take out for ice cream because I, I, was, I was a week away from my son who was about five at the time. So I said, listen, I, I got this hole I need filled. So she let me take her, her, her daughter Mia out to ice cream and you know uh, shopping and stuff like that. So I love Tiff and Lynn Lowry. I mean, I've done a lot of great things in my life. I've done a lot of fun things in my life. I've done a lot of incredible things in my life that people just don't believe in. And I say, yeah, I did that. And they're like, yeah, you're so full of crap, Carmen. I'm like, well, you, you just said a few minutes ago that you're not an actor, yet outside of doing stuff like uh, Galactic Gigolo or Psychos in Love, you've also been on One Life to Live. I didn't have to do much acting. I had no, no lines. And, and basically, I was, uh, when Tina was in prison, uh, they, it was a, believe it or not, it was a co-ed prison. So they gave, me, they gave me a prisoner uniform, and they said, just do this, and just do this, and just do this. And then, then um, the, the, uh, one of the cameramen was a friend of mine, and, and he says, let me see if I can get you a line. I said, oh, that'd be great. So we went up to the director, and he goes, yeah, yeah, we'll get him a line. And then it fell through. I didn't, I didn't get a line. But, you know, that wasn't acting. It was just walking. And I'm good at that. I, I don't fall down a whole hell of a lot. Well, you're good at writing, too, because I think you, you wrote, uh, was it Galactic Gigolo or Psychos in Love or both? You I wrote, uh, I co-wrote Galactic Gigolo, Psychos in Love, uh, Cemetery High, and then a whole bunch of other scripts that Gorman and I, Gorman Bouchard and I uh, haven't, you know, haven't made. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I'm a writer. Well, your, your cult films from the 80s, uh, Psychos in Love, Galactic Jiggle, were they shown in theaters or were these straight to video films? What was the distribution of those? Um, Cemetery High was actually shown on USA Up All Night with Rhonda Scherer and Gilbert Gottfried. Mm -hmm. And uh, Galactic Gigolo played the theater on a double bill around the country with um, Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Bolorama. Well, that did get a release. It did. Yeah. But well, we shot that in 35 which was incredible to do that. And Psychos in Love played midnight shows at the Bleecker Street Cinema. Wow. Yeah. For those who don't know, Bleecker Street Cinema was uh, one of the more prestigious uh, art house venues in New York City mm -hmm. uh, for many years. I think it closed down in, in the late 80s or the early 90s. Uh, maybe a little while after that. A little after that, yeah. yeah. This was still when they had the midnight movie circuit because that, that disappeared by the, uh, the 90s when home video came in. Yeah, Psychos in Love... Um, show there the guy was so into showing it <laughs> at the mm -hmm. theater he wanted to release the theme song on a 45 to give it out at the midnight <laughs> showings which he never did and uh yeah and we went to you know a couple of them and and people were uh a lot of mixed reviews i don't, I don't know you've seen I've seen that? yes yeah i mean it's it's not for everybody but those that love it really truly love it's it. a true midnight movie and there, there really aren't those kind of films anymore Mm -hmm. I don't know, what, what, did you intend that film to go to the Midnight Circuit, or were you thinking this could play in the neighborhood theaters uh, during the middle of the day? We had done one film before that, um, Disconnected. Then we did this, that, a second film we shot on video, which I told you is one that <laughs> I'm so happy got, never got released. And then we did um, Psychos in Love, just in the hopes of getting it to go to video. And um, when it played at the Bleecker Street, that was just a wonderful thing. We were very happy with, with that. And then it went, and then it went to video, um, or maybe it was already on video. Uh, but we had no idea what had happened between 1989 until the Internet got big. Because once, once we started getting on the Internet, Cycles in Love was a worldwide phenomenon, and I had no idea. I've got fans all over the world who send me emails and, and, and fan letters and stuff, and I'm like, really? And then they... People quote the film. Isn't often. it a huge hit in Germany? It was a huge hit in Germany to the to the extent that a DVD um, company in Germany got bombarded with letters from the Germans saying we want Psychos in Love on DVD. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was before you know when DVD was young. And they got in touch with Gorman, and, and Gorman gave them the blessing. And there was only three hundred of the German ones that came to America, and. Um, all the rest that sold like crazy. Then they re-released it, and then other countries hopped on board. And then finally, a few years ago, the United States hopped on board, and we got it released in the United States. But it was released all over the world. And um, I mean, I've got um, literally fans that I became friends with on Facebook, and I'm, I'm close to, even though I never met them. But they're just wonderful people, and 
man, they quote the shit out of that film, and I just can't believe it. Isn't that scary when, when somebody comes up to you and starts quoting a, a, one of your films, and you sort of forgot the dialogue? And you, uh, That happened to me one time, because uh, we were both in Bikini Bloodbath, uh-huh. though we didn't have a scene together, and I had met somebody. <laughs> That's kind of our catchphrase And uh, someone came up to me and started quoting my character's dialogue back to me in the voice that I used for that film. I didn't use my natural speaking voice. And my initial reaction is, what, what is wrong with this poor man? Uh-huh. And then he looked at me and said, don't you remember this? And I said, what are you doing? And he just he had to explain that uh, he, was, uh, he was doing me. And I didn't even recognize it. Yeah, so, well, one of the weirdest things was uh, Broom Street Theater in Madison, Wisconsin, which is owned by mm, the director of uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and, and Reanimator, Stuart Gordon. And uh, the guy there uh, asked Gorman uh, for the rights to turn Cycles of Love into a play, a musical. Uh, well, it was partly musical. And Gorman gave him the rights. And I, never, I didn't get to see it. I was, in, I was in Hollywood at the time with my daughter on a vacation in Hollywood. And uh, I asked the guy, I said, would it be any way that you have a, like a video copy of this play? And he goes, sure. And he sent me a copy. This is actually a scene from the play on the, on the, the U.S. Um, DVD, but he sent me the whole thing, and I watched it, and he took some artistic license with it. Uh, some of it not so good, but some of it pretty good. And uh, to see someone, do, you know, a lot of Psychos in Love, you know, Gorman and I wrote, and then sometimes we would, he would let me go, you know, and say, all right, do this, and then I would just ad lib, and and he said, yeah, yeah, do that when we film, and then when we film, I would do something completely different, and he was like, oh my God, but it would always, it would, he would keep it. So to see this actor who played me mm-hmm. in the play do those lines that were just throwaway lines to me that just didn't weren't in the script they were just that it was just amazing and he he was me and there was a girl playing Debbie and you know mm-hmm. girl play, a guy playing Frank and it was just like I was just so beside myself I was just overly flattered that oh my god these people loved it enough to turn it into a play and it played to packed houses and one woman was such a fan she found out it was a play she flew from Boston to Madison just to see the play. <laughs> like, wow. It's just incredible. So I have to ask Debbie if she ever saw that movie because, uh, you know, Galactic Gigolo, yeah, okay, that was all right. Well, Galactic um, Gigolo was filmed uh, is in Prospect, Connecticut, which is one town over from it, where we are now. Right. It was filmed, um, believe it or not, in Cheshire and Waterbury. The only thing I think we actually filmed in Prospect was when I was pointing to the Prospect sign. But uh, it got, did you know it got banned in Prospect? No, I wasn't aware of that. Yes, it was banned in Prospect. Is there a movie theater in Prospect for it to be banned in? No, no. when it came out, <laughs> we had filmed a scene, or a couple of scenes down at the uh, Waterbury City Hall. And while filming there, um, we, uh, we had, I had to get permission. I was working for the city at the time, and I had to get permission from um, Mayor Santa Petro to film there. He was mayor at the time. So I got permission. And of course, Gorman, when he was doing the credits, gave a thank you to the city of Waterbury and Mayor Santa Petro for letting us use City Hall. Well, in, Galact- in Galactic Gigolo, one of the themes is, one of the storylines is that I am a broccoli from outer space who wins a trip on a game show to go to Prospect, Connecticut, which is known as the horniest town in the galaxy. Why we use the real town, I don't know, but Prospect is just a perfect name because Prospect, Prospects. And... Um, we portrayed Prospect as a town full of um, Hasidic hillbillies and um, <laughs> like very slow mafiosos. You know, who went to, that's smart. So when it got released on video, somebody uh, in Prospect rented it from a video store, not mine, um, and brought it to the mayor and was very upset that we portrayed Prospect as such. And uh, he said that he can't believe that the mayor of Waterbury let us use. And so. They called me, <laughs> the, the city, uh, the mayor's office called me and said, do, do you happen to have a copy of Galactic Gigolo? I said, well, yeah. He says, can you bring it down to the mayor's office, please? I said, okay. So I brought it down to the mayor's office, and the city lawyer, uh, you know, he said, put it on, and put it on. He goes, all right, fast forward. Uh, and I fast forward a little bit more. And he, then I can see a smile playing about his lips. Then he starts laughing at all this tomfoolery in the movie. So finally he says, they, they can't do anything. Well, the next day in the paper, the mayor, Mayor Chatfield of Prospect, um, asked them to pull it off the shelves, and it said "banned in prospect." <laughs> so, 
So when I moved, I opened up a store. I used to have one down in Union City. I moved it to Prospect. You had a video store. I had a, yeah, remember Fun Stuff Video? Yes. <laughs> so I moved uh, Fun Stuff Video from Union City up the street to uh, up Route 68, right at the end of Route 68. And I made damn sure that I had several copies of Galactic Gigolo in my store so I can rent them to the Prospect people whenever I got a chance. Is it still banned in Prospect as far as you know? They rented it, and no one came knocking at my door saying, we need you to pull that off the shelves. And if they did, I would say absolutely not. Oh, dear. Yeah. Well, we're talking with Carmen Capo Bianco, who is uh, going to be appearing in Model Hunger. Is this coming out on DVD this year? Do you know the... Yes. Um, it's coming out in July. We're having a huge autograph party at um, 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 Planet Ho- No, Planet Hollywood. Forbidden Planet in, uh, in New York. And um, Debbie asked some of us to go, and I said I would love to go. And I... I'm hoping Debbie's going to be there. I know Susie Lorraine. You know Susie? I don't know her personally. No. Okay. I don't know her personally either, but I was in a movie with her. I never got a scene with her. Um, did you know Susie? You know that movie with, with Hugh Grant where he plays an 80s pop singer? I think it's called Music and Lyrics. Yes. Okay. So. Well, at the beginning of the movie, there's a music video where they sing Pop Goes My Heart. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the video, uh, Hugh Grant is laying on a table, and he's being tended to by this beautiful blonde nurse. That's Susie Lorraine. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to hold that thought because we're going to take a five-minute break uh, to uh, bring oh, in some of our advertisers. I'm, I'm done with it. You're done I'm with done it? I'm done with that thought, yeah. Excellent. So <laughs> uh, give us five minutes. Uh, say hi to our advertisers when the show is over, and we'll be back. Debbie Rashan's joining us at the bottom of the hour. See you on my movie show on PPRN Radio. <laughs> Hi there, and if you need any kind of work done to your car, you can try DeSilva's Auto Body, located in Naugatuck at 275 Rubber Avenue. Serving the Naugatuck Valley community with the highest quality of craftsmanship for 25 years, we pride ourselves in delivering on our promise of extraordinary customer service and product satisfaction. We have recently expanded our business with in-house experts in the industry gold standard equipment. So once again, give us a call at DeSilva's Auto Body, 203-729-5967. That's 203-729-5967, located in Naugatuck. Took on rubber avenue. Once again, the Silva's Auto Body 203 729 5967. Yeah! Yeah! You just hear how bad that sounded, but you won't get that sound at Hat City Music Productions, located at 536 Federal Road in Brookfield. CEO Chris Litwin takes your music to the next level. If you're tired of those basement recordings, those people that you pay too much money for and have you get out within a half hour, well, you won't have that problem. Hat City Music Productions, once again located at 536 Federal Road in Brookfield. Go check out Hat City Music Productions. You won't be disappointed. Tell them PBRN sent you. Ah, oh, fuck! Ah, oh, fuck! <laughs> Hey, dude, where did you get this freaking stellar water pipe? At Shock and Awe in Waterbury. Where? Shock and Awe Smoke Shop in Waterbury. Dude, don't tell me you haven't been there. I don't know. Listen, you gotta go there. Shock and Awe is way different from those crappy mall stores. They have some sick ass glass pipes from crazy ass glass blowers. And get this they even have a community art gallery where they host drum circles, poetry jams, and they do music too. Wow, no way. Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, they have everything down there, even medical grade. Dude, I'm down. Where is it? I told you, it's in Waterbury on Huntington Avenue. Just get off exit 36 from Route 8. Here, I've been following them on Instagram for a while, Shock and Awe Smoke Shop. Take a look at this picture. Wow, man, that rig is ill. Yeah, dude, I'm telling you, they're always posting new shit. Dude, as soon as I get my car back, I'm heading to Shock and Awe. Hey Matt, we need to write a commercial for the product supply. Okay, we'll promote our grinders, bats, or the hand-carved dugouts. Well, our one-hitters in our dugouts are already super popular. Yeah, people can definitely see the quality difference. Right, so we probably don't need to focus on those. But our premium grinder's brand new, so why don't we go with that? Cool, what features should we hit on? 
Well, it's a kick-ass grinder and getting rave reviews already, so we could use one of the testimonials saying it's the best grinder they've ever used. Nah, that's cheesy. Let's stick to the features. All right, all right. So the key is really the sharp teeth. And the holes. And the number and the size of the holes. Yeah, they let the herb fall through without getting jammed up in the chamber. Right, because nobody likes the weed traffic jam going on. There's also a Teflon ring that helps the lid slide easily. And the super strong magnet in the lid. And the pollen catcher. Ugh, we're never going to get through all this in 60 seconds. Well, just ask them to follow us on Instagram and Facebook, or visit our website at www.greengoddesssupply.com. Hi, I'm Phil Hall, and I have a question for you. Are you in need of professional video production service? If you are, I'd like to recommend my friends over at Mass Video Productions. They're based in Quincy, Massachusetts, but they do business all over the United States, and they do a great job. They specialize in corporate videos, whether it's communications from your CEO, employment recruitment, training videos for new employees. They can also help you if you need a video for uh, a television or an internet commercial. Maybe you need a music video for your band, or you want a video for a special event in your life. I'm not just saying this reading from the script. I use Mass Video Productions for my Business Superstar website, and I have been very, very impressed by the high quality of their production. If you don't believe me, look it up online. Go to massvidpro.com or call 617-319-3434. Again, massvidpro.com or 617-319-3434. And tell them Phil Hall sent you. Are you located in the Middlebury area? Or the Waterbury area? Check out International Wine and Liquor at 756 Turnpike, located next to the subway. Or JT Wine and Liquor at 952 Chase Parkway, Waterbury, Connecticut, next to Spartans. Both have a wide variety of beer, craft beer, scotches, bourbon, vodka, cognac, and rum. And a large selection of wines. Once again, if you're located in the Middlebury area, check out International Wine and Liquor 750 Straight Turnpike, next to the subway. Or if you're in the Waterbury area, check out JT Wine and Liquors at 952 Chase Parkway, Waterbury, Connecticut, next to Spartan. And let them know that PBRN sent you. Okay, we're back on the online movie show. I'm Phil Hall. I have Carmen Capobianco in the studio with me. And uh, who's that on the phone? Well, this would be Debbie Rochon. I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat that, please? I didn't get, quite get that. <laughs> this is Debbie Rashawn. Debbie hey, Rashawn. Hey, hey. Hello, Debbie. We had a little bit of an audio glitch here, so I didn't hear you. Hi, you're, uh, thanks for joining <laughs> us. A bit early, but uh, more time for you. That's great. How's, uh, what are you doing up in Canada? Um, well, I, you know, if I had to tell you, then it wouldn't be a secret. Ah. Well, and, you know, there's some things better left unsaid until they're ready to be exposed. Ooh. Speaking of exposure, uh, I, I, had <laughs> asked, I had asked Carmen what it was like to be directed by you. What was it like for you to direct uh, the legendary Carmen Capobianco in Model Hunger? Oh, well, that well that's a dream come true because um, I've been a fan of the galactic gigolo since the 80s when I saw the movie. Wow. I love you, Debbie. So, you know, Debbie. that was, I actually ha got the movie from, I was living, let me see, at that time, in um, on Court Street in Brooklyn. Oh, God. And um, there was a small mom-and-pop store. I had seen, it, as I was going through the entire store, all of the horror section, um, I came upon Galactic Gigolo. And, of course, I picked it up and watched it, and I had never seen anything like it. And I was floored, and I was like, this is hilarious. This is absolutely great. Good stuff, you know, like really crazy, funny, northeastern, um, indie, 80s film, which I was really into. I know that sounds weird, but I was really into that, that sort of humor and that style you know, I loved, uh, uh, before I, I knew Lloyd Kaufman himself, I, I saw the Toxic Avenger because I'd worked with someone who, who had played Toxie uh, on something else. And, um, you know, Slime City and um, all that kind of stuff, like all the Hen and Lauder movies. Uh, I mean, Frankenhooker was on the subways, you know, the poster was on the subways, you, you would go down and all that, and uh, I was a big fan of the whole scene, so I just thought, well, this is great stuff, and so finally, you know, I met him eventually, 
And when the script came along via James Morgart, I, I was thinking to myself, one of the first things, the very first person I cast in my mind was Babette Bombshell to be one of the models. I thought that that would be too good to be true. And that was, you know, I, was just, I hadn't even asked Babette yet, but I was, I had that in my mind. And then I was like, you know, this role of Sal is completely Carmine Capobianco, 100%. I mean, I could do, I could see Carmine doing this so well and so clearly. And um, I asked him and I was lucky enough that he said yes. Well, Carmine uh, actually has said that uh, he was a bit surprised because uh, he's used to doing comedy roles, and this apparently isn't a comedy part. So do you see him as a dramatic actor, that there's a talent there that uh, other filmmakers may have missed? Yes, I do. I really do. And um, that's the thing. Like, he's such a comedian. He's so funny. He's, um, everything you see him in, he's, he's just, you, he, he has the likability and that was the key to the character of Sal, is that you had to like him, even though he may not know what's going on with his wife or, or see that clearly. This type of thing happens to so many of us, you know, but the most important thing is if he was, you know, if he's a little, I wouldn't even say clueless, but just blind to what's going on, um, that kind of helps the situation. But the most important thing is that he had to be incredibly likable character, and this is <clears throat> this is exactly the the vibe that that Carmen has. And you know, yeah, I only saw him in comedies, but I I just knew that if I just kept reminding him, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the shoot, <laughs> hey Carmine, hey, this is not a comedy. Stop uh, being you know, funny. He, you he'd be time. fine, and that's that's okay. all it was. You know, sometimes it's just you think you have to do more or be more. Where it was, it was. It's really hard to just take something a step back and kind of just play it really simple. Um, and that's exactly what he did. But he he did it so easily when I when we worked together. Like you know, you know, I would remind him, sure, but. He he did it, and it was fantastic, and, and the character is extremely likable. Debbie? And that's that's thanks just to his, you know, charisma, his natural charisma. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Debbie, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, it's Carmen. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. I, I uh, Thank you for all those nice things. I said about... 30 minutes worth of nice things about you because you know I adore you. And I've, I've, we actually met in like 93, or, but you never knew I was the Galactic Gigolo back then, which was kind of weird. And it wasn't until, you know, 2013 that you, or 2000, yeah, 13 that you knew I was, which I thought was very cool. But have you watched Psychos in Love yet? You know, I haven't. How horrible is that? That's horrible because that that makes, in the world of comedy, Psychos in Love makes Galactic Gigolo look like Schindler's List. So you... you <laughs> <laughs> but I, I promise, I promise you, I will. You know, it's so horrible how some email. things just kind of slip away. Of like course. You've got of so course. many things to do. And there just isn't enough hours in a day. I know, but it's 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 unforgivable. But no, it's not. I no. must see it because if then in fact Galactic Gigolo turns into Schindler's List, <laughs> then you know, I this I really have to see this. Will you be at um, Forbidden Planet in July? Yes. Oh, then yes. I, I am so there. I miss you so much. I, I can't wait to see it. I miss her too. I it's going to be so much fun. Yes, it will. Yeah, I yes, it will. Debbie, I haven't seen you in six years. Come up to Forbidden Planet. I'll come to. Fi it's a Wednesday, right? You know, the funny thing is, when yeah, I yeah, Debbie. that's right. Wednesday, July thirteenth, of course. It's a Wednesday, not a Friday, but it's the thirteenth. Right, okay. and Phil will come, and he will buy a copy of Model Hunger for everybody he knows. Which is a lot of. Money. Yeah, good. Really, Phil. Real well, I live in Fairfield, Connecticut, so I can afford it definitely. <laughs> but, oh well, there you well, go. Debbie, when I, when I I perfect. Yeah, we De need a whole bunch of you. Yeah, Debbie. When I last saw you six years ago, we were working on Rudyard Kipling's *Mark of the Beast*, and during that time, I had asked you if you had considered uh, directing, 
And when Model Hunger came out, at first I said to myself, aha, Dead Beat listened to me. But it turned out apparently a lot of people over the years have been asking you to direct the film. Why did you decide to do this particular project at this particular time? Well, it's a really good question, Phil, because um, there had been many times where people had said, um, hey, you know, I have this script and you know you'd be you could be in it too and you could direct it and you know it's um it's about this uh killer it kills all these babes and you know not not a comedy or anything just straight you know type of movie and and i just thought to myself well first of all i would never dream to be in the first movie that i direct that's just me many people are that's to each his own and and that's great but i just thought I knew that someone who really, at least were attempting to do something extremely special, that would be a really, really hard thing to pull off. You know, I mean, unless it was like, you know, uh, like my Rocky I had written for myself, and you know what I mean, it was a type of thing. But it, that wasn't the case. It was um, James Morgart, who I had done his first movie, Wanton Baby, with him. And... So he said, he just sent it over and he said, read this. And I had no idea why. I didn't know if he was going to do it. it. Was You know, maybe he was looking for actors. I had no idea. He just said, read it. And I read it and I thought, this is, this is, this is incredible. <laughs> like, holy shit. Oh my God. What the, the things that this has to say and the things that, one could bring to the table as well and say themselves with this material is just insane. This is this is so much fun. It's so good. It's so meaningful. It's so deep and it's so funny, like darkly. And um, so then when he said, well, do you want to direct it? I just said, yeah, 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 I do. I do. I mean, the, it was the material. It it had to be the material. It it couldn't be a really, you know, soggy TNA ridiculous fest like, what, say, one of the first things many you know moons ago I was offered, um, and a lot of the things since then. It's just nothing against any genre. Every genre kind of serves itself and its own people that like it. So that's it. But. For me, it had to be, because I know after doing a number of films that you must live with a movie, um, not just forever as, um, you know, a a physical medium, um, but also as a director, you are living through the pre-production, the shooting, the post, and then finally when it comes out, Pretty much. I mean, people, you really hope and pray, you know, that the the people will love everybody in the movie, love the person who wrote it, and just, you know, heap praise on, on these people. But oh, the most important thing is, if there's any shots to be taken, you are going to be the one to take them. And it has to be something that was really worth it, because especially in this day and age, well, trust me, not everybody's going to like this movie, but there it, it is going to find its audience at the same time. It really is. And so, you know, I, I kind of, it just, it, I had to feel that strongly to go to bat for something. And this, this was the material, this was the one. Well, Debbie, you and Carmen are also in a film together, though you don't have a, a scenes together uh, that just <laughs> came out. Uh, called VHS Massacre, uh, directed by a mutual friend of ours, Tom Seymour, uh, which looks at the rise and fall of the VHS video. Uh, for you, Debbie, and for you, Carmen, what are your feelings of the films of the 80s, the cult films, the horror films, the comedy films like Galactic Gigolo that were being made then, also the, the classic trauma films, versus what's being put out today? Uh, are you nostalgic for the old days, or do you think uh, today is just as good as the past? Well... Quite honestly, Phil, <laughs> excuse me, both. I, I think, you know, there's a magic to the movies being made then because you just came out of the 70s, which were the, um, you know, the 
penultimate for the independent film. I mean, the you know, independent film really did whatever the hell it wanted to. You know, I mean, Midnight Cowboy getting an X. I mean, that was kind of ridiculous. But just the fact that they made that movie and all of these slices of life films um, and then into the 80s, which kind of, you know, took on more of an environmental angle. At least that's when I talk about, like, the Northeast. I, I tend to feel that, uh, generally speaking, a lot of them would have a, a little bit more to do with, you know, environmental stuff, you know, be it in the most ridiculous fashion or in a little bit more serious fashion. And still to date, I mean, if you look at the films of Larry Fessenden and, you know, Wendigo and, and films like this, you, you still see that happening, a little bit more interest in, dare I say, dare I say political things, you know, because, you know, there's, it could be handled in, in a very, very silly ways and very fun ways too, not just serious, but... Um, you know, I I think it, they they both have have something to offer. I think you know it's not even that the films being made that um, are that much worse or better. I think it's just a matter of the volume of them is so much greater now, and uh, the the change of you know it's the whole physical media leaving us very soon, very quickly, and permanently. That just the fact that model hunger comes out. Physically, it's kind of amazing right now. Like, it's just, this is how close we are to going to just streaming. So I think that is something that is the most surprising to me. What about you, Carmen? And what do you think? Well, Pardon me? Oh, no, by Carmen. Oh, Carmine, yeah. Yeah, well, um, being part of it in the 80s, I mean, Debbie was just a little girl when I was uh, doing <laughs> the movies. <laughs> And, um, Too kind, Carla. Uh, okay, well that's you know. so. Um, we were we did our first movie dis disconnected. And we filmed it on sixteen, and thankfully we sold it. And then we raised some money to do Psychos in Love, and it turned out that there was such a, a hunger by these these little minor studios that wanted product because there wasn't there weren't any digital movies coming out so so in order to make a movie you had to raise some serious bucks even if it was it was low budget cuz our biggest cost was the film so we did uh Cycles in Love and Charlie Band bought it and then he said you know what um I, I love this film I want you to do four more for us and he said come up with 10 different scenarios for films so we we came up with 10 we sent them to Charlie Band he said and I'm going to pick four and I, I want to see scripts so he chose four, and by the time we got the, the letter back that he chose four, he had already commissioned posters for these four films, and they were in Variety the next week, and he was pre-selling them all over the world before we even had the script written. So they needed stuff quickly. Now there's such a glut, and it, it's, to a certain degree, I think it's almost anyone who can afford to buy a video camera is a director, and you know some of them really aren't. Um, and then, then there's Debbie Rashan who just... You know, was in, in, in 200 movies, and and she just she she blew the crap out of this movie, you know, and and she was just, uh, and so now there's people are going to want more Debbie Rashan stuff, and they're going to say Debbie, you need to you know get Carmen in and stuff. So uh, basically, there I, that's the difference. Now there's there's so many, and thank God for streaming because or else nobody would have it. You know, I worked for Richard Griffin, and, and so did Debbie. And and he's you know he's turning out movies like crazy too, but his are quality movies, you know. And then there's other people who are just throwing out crap and just hoping that's getting out there. Well, you just said Debbie did 200. I was on the Internet Movie Database today, and I sort of counted close to 300. And I know that you've done movies, Debbie, that aren't on the IMDb. Just how many movies have you made? The movie where she played Malva that counts as five. Yeah. All right. Just <laughs> right, because it's volume one and two combined. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So you know. There you go. How she remembers You know, that. Phil, that, that's tough because I, I would have to say probably some, somewhere around 300 because some of them are not listed as movies. Some of them are not listed whatsoever. Some of them shouldn't be listed. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know how it goes, um, Carmine. I, I do. Mean, <laughs> I do. I mean, the, in, the, I say that with love. You know, you, you go into anything hoping for the best and giving 150%, and mm -hmm. you never know what's going to happen. And, and, and they like to j not only take it out on the director, but they like to take it out on the actor, too. So it's uh, it's pretty amazing. But 
I mean, yeah, an awful lot. Like, um, you know, yeah, I'd say, have to say around 300. I mean, if I at least if I make another 10 more, I'll definitely be there. Do you have a favorite out of the 300? Oh, I couldn't, honestly, I couldn't say one. And the reason is because some are creatively more satisfying and maybe they didn't come together as well or some came together really well and maybe I felt good about what I did in them but the experience wasn't as good as, say, the other one. So it's it for that reason and not political ones, it's very hard to say one because, you know, Nowhere Man is a movie that it was like – Tearing my heart out to make that movie. Loved it. And and the 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 other actor, Michael Roderick, mm -hmm. and he literally there's a scene in there, um, and it's not pretty, and it's not nice, and it's not meant to be. And there's a scene where, um, right in the middle of having sex, and in this particular scene, you don't see anything. It's not about the nudity. You don't see any nudity. Right in the in the middle of a fight, you know how couples can have sex, but then it turns strangely into rape, like right in a couple of beats of the scene, and it gets really weird, really fast, and uncomfortable, and really ugly, and it, it was intended that way, and it comes across. And I'll tell you something: Michael Roderick, for example, is one of those actors that just you know, no matter what he does, he's just ridiculously good. One of these guys. Um, me, I had to work a hell of a lot harder to <laughs> to be good. He's just one of these that has that magic touch, you know. God touched him on the head and said, you know, behold, you are an actor. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And he was having a really hard time. And he, he was one of the producers of the movie, too. And so he was well aware of the script. But he, you know, even said to the director, you know, do we have to do this? Not me, the, the female. He was, you know, because he had to, like, end up raping my character, his character. Um, so he had to have, like, a beer, maybe two beers. And, you know, this is not an actor that would ever do something like that before performing, but under the circumstances. Uh, so, I mean, it, it was really intense. So for this reason, that's up there is probably is in experiences probably in the top five for sure what projects are both of you currently uh working on that uh, should be coming out later this year or perhaps into next year we'll start with you carmen um i just finished um seven norms of death with richard griffin and i, I got to see a finished and it's hysterically funny it's one of his best comedies and it's it's so bizarre um, I think in a couple of weeks I'm going to shoot something with uh, James Balsamo, and uh, I'm embarrassed because I can't remember the title, but I think it's Killer Waves. And then I'm doing a bunch of conventions this, this year, and I'm so excited to go to Forbidden Planet and see Debbie and Susie, and hopefully James will be there. And just These are people that, um, and I, I thank you, Debbie, for allowing me to be in this movie, but these are people that I instantly fell in love with, and, and it's just this will be the highlight of my life, and I don't think anything will ever top that. And Debbie, what uh, projects outside of Model Hunger are you working on? Well, you know, I can't say anything after that because the, getting to, to work with my hero... GG, and I'm not even saying it that he's older than me because I don't know that he is. I say my hero because I, you know, I've been a fan forever. It's seriously, Model Hunger coming out. This is like I've said before, you know, directorial debut and all. Uh, this has been something that I've been working and 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 slaving towards, so to speak, in the most loving way possible for the past years since we shot it, and so. Yeah, Wednesday, July 13th, Carmine Capobianco, who, by the way, Forbidden Planet is excited to have him there. Um, <laughs> when I mentioned to them, you know, us doing a signing, is Carmine coming? So, you know, this is, I'm lucky he said yes. Voltaire is going to be there. Oh, cool. James Morgart, Excellent. who's the writer and the producer. Um, Susie? I have to think, well, Voltaire. Susie? Susie Lorraine. Mary Bogle. Oh, really? Mary's coming um, in? Pa yeah. 
Isn't that incredible? That is. Possibly um, Bob Bozek. I'm not entirely sure. Cool. Um, possibly Michael Thurber. Wow. Um, How about Greg? Is Greg David Morancic. David's going to be Myself. there? Myself. Oh, man. Dave. Do you know David? I don't know. The the film itself, Model Hunger, this is going to be released. Is it Wild Eye Releasing doing the DVD? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Wild Eye Releasing um, July 12th, just the day before. So this is the day after. And then it's actually going to have a signing <clears throat> in the following Saturday, July 16th, on the West Coast at Dark Delicacies with the, the West Coast cast. So... De Debbie, wow. have you ever done work for the Hollywood studios? Have you strictly been uh, independent cinema? Strictly independent. I have done some TV. I've done a couple of TV movies. Um, I just recently signed with uh, an agent that you know is based in L.A., so I do a lot of stuff, um, obviously not in person, but um, on camera, but it's a brand new um, situation that I'm in. But I felt like it's not that I don't love the independent films, and I will, you know, certainly continue to do them. But, um, you know, I just I felt like, wow, that there's some really, really amazing, well-written stuff on TV right now. And that never used to be the case. I mean, that's like another thing that's completely changed. So I just really wanted very, very much to get involved with um, that stuff as well. So, um so, yeah, they're here, here's to the future. Indeed. Okay, so July 12th from Wild Eye Releasing, look for Model Hunger DVD, I assume Blu-ray as well. And will this also be on Netflix and Amazon and the whole nine yards for the streaming? Well, well, definitely Amazon, Amazon Prime. I hope Netflix. I imagine it's one of those things that if you put it in your queue, that if they have enough um, requests for it, they will actually stream it. So I'm kind of guessing at that. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Tell them you want it. <laughs> tell them I want you want it, it I want everybody. It. Tell, them I want it. tell everybody you want it. We want it. And we want it. Is yeah. Galactic Gigolo on uh, Netflix and Amazon Prime? Um, it's not streaming. You can get Galactic Gigolo, Psychos in Love, and a lot of other crap I was in oh, I'm from Netflix. But, yeah. Yeah, and hopefully Model Hunger, because Model Hunger, like I said, is just a great movie. It was, it was one of the few movies that I was in that I watched from start to finish, and I don't usually do that, and it scared the hell out of me. And I knew everybody was in it, but Lynn Lowry was just like, uh, she's like the new, you know, Jason. She's just, he was just. Yes. You know? Yes. She was, she was scary. She was scary. And also, I think uh, uh, the two of you are in VHS Massacre, which is online. I think Troma has their own streaming. Troma service. has that, yeah. And it's on. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Troma picked that up, which was pretty. Apropos, oh. I think. Indeed, and that's streaming now. I, I, I don't recall the name of their channel, but I'm sure if you just go to the trauma side, you'll be able to find it. I know it's going to be on uh, DVD and Blu-ray uh, coming in June. So. Cool. Is, is, oh, wow. is, is Model Hunger going to be on Blu-ray? Um, I don't believe so. Okay. I believe it's, a, it's, see, everything's about numbers and right. seeing mm -hmm. how the physical medium does here. So it's definitely DVD. In the fall, we're going to do a special VHS, very limited edition. With cool. um, there was a sort of a, a painting of Lynn's face that wasn't the official cover. It was sort of a, a mock-up of the cover. Saw that. That's that was going great. to be like a the VHS cover um, in the fall. So we have that going on, and you know, it's all about numbers. If it does well, I have no doubt that. It will turn to Blu-ray, but it's for the going to blow release, the roof off, DVD. Debbie. It's going to blow the roof off the video business. It's going to be incredible, and it's also going to blow if, it wide open. Wide open, baby. Um, <laughs> if anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to see a very rare video of the only scene between Debbie Rashawn and Carmen Capobianco, go to my Facebook page and you can watch that. That's a very rare video. Excellent. Okay. Well, looking forward to that. <laughs> go there now. You don't remember filming it with me? Yes, I do. Yes. But I have to go there now and watch it. <laughs> so, CarmineCapobianco.com? No, Facebook. I'm Facebook. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there, there is CarmineCapobianco.com. You can go there and um, I'm, I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. put it there if you can't get on Facebook. I miss you on Facebook. I, I miss seeing your comments every day, but I understand why you're not on there. So. Well, oh, I know. Um, uh, Phil, I have one of the, those like pages because I had three regular pages and they were all, they all got filled up. And I thought, 
I'm not running 150 different pages. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Who has the time to do that? I just get one that everybody can go to, but then it turns out that you can't interact with regular pages, so to speak. So to speak. So there yeah. you go, Phil. I mean, uh, what's up with that? Well, Come De- on, Zuckerberg. Yeah. Well, Debbie, uh, our time is unfortunately coming to a close. No. Thank you. Yes. Un- well, we'll have you. <laughs> We'll have you back, baby, when you're on Blu-ray. Well, definitely. Let's uh, make a promise for One that. One of my movies finally did go yes, to Blu-ray. Yes, thank you so Excellent. much for having us on, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and I, I hope to see you again. It's been too long, and thanks for calling. Yes, me. Forbidden Planet. Yes, I can't wait. I can't wait to see you, Deb, and okay. really soon. Take me care. too. Thank you. Okay, good night, Debbie. Thank you. Bye-bye. And Bye-bye. Our- our time is coming short, so comment. Thank you for coming into our studio. It was, it was totally my pleasure, Phil. Sharing uh, your films, Model Hunger, VHS Massacre, and, of course, the classics that you've been in. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully you'll listen in for uh, our show next week because on uh, the online movie show for next Monday at 7 p.m., we're going to have another icon from the underground movie scene. I don't know if you know Michael Leggi out of uh, Massachusetts. He's made a bunch of very idiosyncratic comedy films, uh, Working Stiffs, Loons, uh, Honey Glaze, My Mouth Lies Screaming. Uh, you're looking at me like... No, sure. Yeah, I, I, sure yeah. I know him, of course. <laughs> Well, you're gonna have, if you don't know his work, you're going to learn about it. He's really uh, he's one of the most in- inventive and original talents. And the as next well. time you have Manjol on, I want to be on. Mike Manjol, definitely. Also on next week's show, we're going to have a woman named Erica Jordan. She's a filmmaker out of San Francisco. And the reason we have movies on the Internet is because of Erica Jordan and me. And there's a story behind that. Whoa. And you tune in next week to PPRN Radio, and you'll listen, and you'll learn how Erica and I brought movies to the Internet. And you're not going to push your book tonight? I want to hear about your book. The, that's In Search of Lost Films. That comes out in August. <laughs> there's a little time for that. Oh, a little bit early on the music. But stay tuned here on PPRN. At 8 p.m., we're going to be having Undiscovered, which is the, uh, the best of under-the-radar music talent. Uh, other stations are listening to Undiscovered, and they're uh, helping themselves to some of the talent that we've been broadcasting. And hey, that's uh, good. Get the music out there. Let uh, let people know that there is something beyond the uh, the Hollywood uh, labels and studios and whatnot. There's a lot of great talents here in the state of Connecticut. And uh, thank you so much for having throughout. me, Phil. I love well, thank you, here. Carmen. Thank you. Uh, and tune in also tomorrow on PPRN Radio at 7 p.m. Eastern. Peter Pinho's talk show is going to be on the air. His guests are the band OK and the Night Crew and the wonderfully talented comic Allison Sarstai. I'm Phil Hall. This is the Online Movie Show. We'll see you next week, and thanks for listening. We're going to have Tommy on now?